thanks for having me in, in the conference. And so yeah, very much related to the previous paper. And so it's a joint work with, uh, with Trevor at the University of Calgary. So the motivation of this paper is to try to understand what kind of reform that happens in China that has uh, driven the, the, the faster growth uh, that we, 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 we've seen. So one of the things that people tend tends to emphasize is the export. So we're talking about export-driven growth in China uh, since 2001 after China joined the WTO. And also related to that, many people argue the reason China was able to using export as a, as a force for growth, as a driver for growth, is because they have this massive reservoir of rural migrant workers who helps to migrate to the, to the, to the, to the to the city, working the factories, kept keeping the wage low, that therefore keeping the cost of Chinese goods low, and so those, are, so the, the migration and trade are very much in, in related in, in terms of this narrative about export-driven growth or export-led growth. But uh, so far, there's very little quantitative work to evaluate uh, that claim. So that's what we want to do here: is we want to write down a quantitative model that we can actually uh, evaluate. And this claim, and some other, and also other related issues. In general, the, the, the framework we're going to use is going to think about how does a trade cost change, and how does a change in migration cost will contribute to the aggregate growth in the economy. So what we do here then is we, we put uh, kind of three sets of data together. One is about the migration. So here's, here. It's really about um, uh, migrant workers and in how they distribute uh, uh, across space uh, and between sectors. So that, that's, that's we, can, we get those data from the census from 2000 and 2005. We use two census so that we can look at the changes in the, in the stock of migrants and therefore can using that to back out the, trade, the migration costs based on the model. And also we do the similar thing for the trade costs by looking at the trade flows not only internationally, but also internally. So the, we have these bilateral trade matrices for, for internal trade between provinces in China. Again, for 2002 and 2007, using that, then we can back up the change in trade costs. So then we, with this estimate, so using, to, in order to estimate this, we need, we need to have some structure to estimate. So and the, the model we use then is a general equilibrium model of internal and external trade that's basically based on the Ethan Corden, extension of Ethan Corden model by introducing a label, a partial labor mobility into the model and that allows us to use the model to, to estimate this cost. And then we can, using the model to do the kind of factors, say how does the change in the cost affect the growth and the welfare and structural change and, and all, the, all the other all the interesting uh, quantities that, that we can use the model to do. And w once we have that, then in particular, the, in, the today's, in this paper, we're focused on the growth. So the focus on the aggregate growth, and we're going to do a growth accounting and think about how the trade liberalization, both internal and external, contribute to growth, and how much the reduction in the in migration costs, both within province and cross province, contribute to growth. And then, and then what are the the residual productivity is contributing to growth. So that's what we're going to do in this paper. Okay. So uh, this is a brief background. Most of you probably uh, know, know about this already. So this is a map of China, and the, the darker colors represent higher income per capita. So you can see most of the, the rich areas are in the eastern, eastern coast area, coastal provinces. And the disparity in terms of income is high. So the, the top, quote, top, top quartile versus the, the lower quartile differences in relative income is, uh, is all, I guess, uh, close to 3.5. So that's very, very large disparities. And just to give you a sense of how large that is, you have, if, these are the real income differences controlling for price difference across regions. But you get that, Norm, even just get the 3.5 normal differences, you have to go back to the U, in, in the US, you have to go back to the 19th century. And that's not controlling for price differences across states. So this suggests that there's an enormous uh, income disparity across, across regions in China, which suggests that thinking about uh, this uh, friction, labor market friction is very important. <clears throat> so here's about, about the migration. So this is some, some 
the, the, the graph here shows that the, the, the dark blue ones are the region that send out the migrants. So you can see most the migrants uh, come from the, the middle and, and, and southwest areas. And the dark red ones are the receiving provinces, so the mostly coastal areas. And in terms of the, uh, the, 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 migration st the migrant worker stock, so we distinguish between interprovincial and interprovincial uh, migration. So the interprovincial migration is actually turns out to be quite, quite low in, in, in the data we have from 2000 to 2005. So in 2005, the interprovincial migrants is only 7.2% of the employment. But the intra-provincial is much larger. In, in, in 2005, it's about 18% of, of, the, of the total employment. And most of these uh, migrants uh, are young, without children, and most of them came from agriculture. But there are also urban to urban migration, the people with uh, non-agricultural hukou and then migrate to some other provinces or some other locations within China, within the provinces. So we're going to talk about the, the, the cause of uh, migration. I guess uh, Chris already discussed uh, many of that. The main cause is associated with the neck access of the social services. The migrant workers who work in, the, in, in a location without the uh, hookah registration in that location. So that, that's what we're going to focus on as well. Now, so let me talk a little bit more about the uh, internal trade cost. So the internal trade cost, I would think that there are two things. One is just the uh, uh, transportation cost. And that could be very, very high in the early years in China because of the lack of infrastructure. And then, and that, that, and, and then they, they went down because also the investment infrastructure. That's one part of the internal trade cost. The second part is, I think has to do with uh, market protection. And so if you know, find out the, this paper by Chung Wen and his co-authors shows that if you look at the uh, cross-region variations, if there's a protection, then the industry tends to diversify. You have to produce everything. And what they show that the degree of diversification is positively correlated with the share of the state sector in the economy. And so there's the, the reason those protections could go down because of the reform of SOEs. As, as the SOE, the importance of SOEs across the location declines, that also helps to reduce the local protection and then reduce internal trade costs. So, 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 so those are the things that we try to, uh, I think, we're going to estimate the cost not directly, but using kind of some kind of gravity equations to estimate using the data uh, the, of the trade flows. But these are kind of the background about what, what, what are they and why they have changed over time. Let me talk about the model. So, Albert, when, when do I stop? 10.25, okay. All right. So given the time constraint, I'm, I'm not going to, and the model is pretty complicated, so I'm not going to talk, go through the model at all. I'm just going to briefly describe what the model is. So we're going to have N plus one regions, and so N provinces in China and then the rest of the world and, and as N, N plus one uh, region. And within each region, we have two sectors. We have agriculture and non-agriculture. So we're going to, agriculture will be rural, and non-agriculture will be, will be urban. So, so in the model, we're going to have rural urban migrations within the province. Or could, there could be also urban to urban migrations or rural rural migrations or rural urban migration across provinces as well. <clears throat> and so the, 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 the trade here, so there's going to be both internal trade and international trade. And the, the framework we use is basically is extension of eastern quarters to multiple regions that and like we're read, writing that did. So I guess what we, the, the new here in terms of modeling is introduce the migration choices in, into the multi-region trade models. So w the way we, we, we model the migrations, we, we introduce worker heterogeneities in terms of the productivity. So each worker is going to indulge with productivities in uh, <clears throat> that may vary across locations, and that, that, that will generate some selection issues for workers. And, and, and so the, given the income difference across regions, then worker will decide where to work. So yeah, so here, here's a, how, how the migration is modeled. Because that's a, the, the, so I'm just going to go through this because this is a new part of the, uh, in, in terms of the modeling part, the, the, the new part of the paper. So given the real income per effective worker, because the worker is heterogeneous in terms of productivity, so we look at the efficient units of labor, then the efficient, per efficient units of labor, 
the income, the real income in region I sector K, let's say it's VIK, and we assume that the effective income the workers get will depend on the efficient units in the location and sector, so that's that IK. And so, so, the, so the workers' productivity may vary across location, across sectors, but in addition to that, the, the, the workers' productivity is also subject to some migration costs. So this is what Chris talked about, uh, whether it's 90% or 50% for lambda. So this is so the one minus mu is, is corresponding to the lambda that Chris was talking about. Okay, so, there's migration, so when they move, then they're, they're going to suffer this migration cost. If they don't move, then mu is going to be equal to one. And then just to, to make the model tractable, we assume this uh, heterogeneous productivity follows a free shade distribution. So then we can get kind of a gravity equation for the, for the percentage of workers who migrate from province N to province I. And that's the yes, equation we're going to use. Question. Yes? And uh, the right, oh, that's the income. That's income. That's income, yeah. yeah. So the VI is the income per efficiency unit. And then the, 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 the mu and ZI represent the productivity of the work in that location after the migration comes. Any, any more questions about the, the model? OK, so, not, so that, that basically, I mean, it's all in the paper, so I don't have time to go through the details. So let me just go through the quantitative exercise. So we're going to show you how we calibrate the model, and then how we estimate the trade and migration costs. And then we're going to feed those uh, estimated trade and migration costs into the model to quantify the effects of cost changes. And, and then we're going to do a full gross accounting by matching the, by changing the residual productivity in each province and sector to match the actual GDP growth in each region. And so then we can, we can account for how you uh, quantify how important are the reduction trade costs, migration costs to the growth. And then finally, if I have time, I'll talk about the potential further gains from redu reducing this cost to, to the aggregate growth. Okay, so let's first talk about calibrating the model. So I'm just going to focus on the last numbers here. So the, all the production numbers are pretty straightforward coming from the input output tables. And in the, trade, the, the trade elasticity, which is, which is in, in, in this model, is related to the dispersion of productivity or of firms that's just taken again di directly from the literature. Which, 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 is, which, which is around four, that determines the elasticity of trade. So the, the, the number that I'm going to talk about here is about the income dispersion uh, related to parameter kappa. So remember I have these workers have the productivity draws across different locations and sectors full of free shade distribution. So, and, and in that free shade distribution, if you take the log of that, then the log differences in income or productivity across, across these workers uh, within a group. So the, you look at a group of people who are going from Sichuan to Guangdong. You look at that subgroup, look at the income differences. So in the model, all those differences coming from productivity differences, the, the, the random draws. So and, and the, in, the, in the model, then the log of the income differences follow a gamble distribution with a standard deviation of pi over kappa uh, times square root of six. So we can look at the data about the income dispersion and back out of cover. And then cover turns out to be 2.54. We also try to control for some observable differences about schooling and so on. Actually, it doesn't change the cover that much. So we, we just go with 2.54. So that's a key number. Because this would, the heterogeneity would decide how responsive the workers are to the change in migration cost. So that's the calibration. Now we estimate the, the, the trade cost and the migration cost. So basically we use the, the, the model implied gravity equations to back out what the, what the trade cost is. So, we, so for, for trade cost, we see the trade flows, and then using the trade flows, and then we, we, we try to we try, we, we, you can actually use the trade shares. In, in, most of, in, this, in this class of models, in a, actually in a large class of models, you can back out the trade, share, the trade cost just looking at the trade shares and then trade elasticity parameter. However, we, here, we, we're going to think about price level differences across regions. This is a paper by Michael Wall shows that uh, if you assume symmetric trade costs, which makes the estimated trade costs very easy, then you're going to generate counterfactual implications about price levels. Uh, so he's looking at international context. 
And since we're going to think about workers' migration decisions, we should explicitly take into account the price differences in the model. So we want, we, we, we also, we want to make sure that we, the model give, uh, give rise to the consistent uh, prediction about price level difference across provinces. So we, we like Michael Wall, we introduce asymmetric trade costs. That help us to that, that help us in terms of uh, matching the, the price level difference across regions, and then the estimation is a little bit more involved. But you can do some fixed fixed effect regression based on the trade trade flows to estimate that. So here's the result. So we find that trade costs quite high. So the, this is a tariff equivalent trade cost for agriculture is about three hundred percent, land agriculture is about two hundred percent. So just uh, as a benchmark, so for for Canada, I think that every, in agriculture, the trade cost is probably about 150%. So, so it's about, about, about double. <clears throat> and we, when we look at the change, so we, look at, we estimate this using the trade flow data from 2002 and 2007. So then we can look at the change in the trade cost. So the, the average tra trade cost, because we have many provinces, so each province, a pair, is going to have a trade cost. And so these are basically trade volume weighted averages. We find that the change, on average, the trade cost has gone down. In fact, most of the province pairs, the trade cost has gone down, both internationally and, uh, and internally. So that, that, that's the magnitude of reductions. So you can, one thing I want to emphasize here is that between 2000, 2002 and 2007, after China joined the WTO, not only the international trade cost has gone down, but the internal trade cost has gone down significantly as well. So, that's about trade costs. What about the migration costs? So, so again, we're using this gravity equation, and we have the data about the migration flows, and we have the data about the real income differences. We can infer from, from, from the model and, and the GDP, real GDP data. So then we can use that equation to back out the migration costs. So this is so the one minus mu will be the lambda that Chris was talking about. But here, we're going to have, we do have heterogeneous lambda across locations, across regions. So we're going to, uh, for each, province, each pair of provinces, we're going to estimate the lambda there. <clears throat> so this is give you some kind of a rough sense graphically about the cost of moving to Guangdong. <clears throat> so you can see, not surprisingly, then the central and, and the west areas is, uh, it, uh, it has a higher cost. I mean, actually, the northern area has a higher cost to the coastal area. In, uh, that Sichuan and the central, actually, the cost is relatively no, and then there's a migra migration cost out of Sichuan. So here's, here's the, the overall numbers. So actually, so the, the numbers we, we calculate on average now is actually, I don't know which version of the paper you look at. So, the, so here, the, 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 the new estimate here, the migration cost in 2005, overall is actually about 57%. But there's a, there's a significant difference in terms of looking at the rural urban migration within the province compared to the cost of moving between provinces. So I think that in, the, in the earlier version, we didn't think about within province migration. There's no, there was no within province migration. So that's why the, the, the cost tends to be high. So if you look at between province migrations, yeah, the overall cost is about 95%. That's, so that's the number you were mentioned. But the, in terms of rural urban migration, I think a lot of it is actually happening most of it is happening within the province. So then the number is actually closer to 54% rather than, the, no. The, yeah, actually even lower for the uh, agri to, so rural urban within province, about 45%. Close to 50%. Uh, like, uh, which, which is consistent, more consistent with, with the, the micro evidence. And in terms of the change, what we see that is, there's also significant reduction between 2000 and 2005 in terms of the rural urban migration within the province. A very little change for between province migration. So given this, now we, we then we fit into the model and see what's the quantitative, quantitative effects. So first, let's look at the change in the trade cost. So some, a lot of people say a lot, of, a lot of this rural urban migration was driven by the opening of the trade. China joined the WTO, so this export demand for workers, and then they, they draw the migrant workers. So let's see if that's the case. So if you look at the ch change in the trade cost of migrant stock, actually the effect is very small. 
So the, the impact of, of the reduction in trade costs, both internally and internationally, has more effects on, on trade. Actually, also the reduction in internal trade costs is almost like a substitute for migration. So you actually, if you, if you only change the internal trade costs, the, migration, the migrant stock will actually go down rather, rather, than, rather than go up. But for the external trade, that should be increases, of course. But there's an there's a enormous heterogeneity. All the numbers we're going to talk about here has enormous heterogeneity. This is the average. So if you look at uh, Shanghai and Guangdong, the reduction trade cost does have an enormous effect on mi migration and increase in migrant stocks. But the average effect actually turns out to be quite small. And the other things about ag the ag aggregate GDP or aggregate welfare, they're not the same thing because of the migration cost. But the, the, the numbers are in the same ballpark. So here, the one main result we have is a reduction in international trade costs. So the associated with joint WTO, the contribution to aggregate growth is very small, about 3%. And the reduction in internal trade costs is much larger. It's, it's close, in, in terms of aggregate welfare, it's about 11%. So, this is take, so the, all the, these exercises take, take the one type of trade cost change at a time and hold everything else constant. Yes. <clears throat> And, and, and see w what the impact it is. So the magnitude of change is from the data about trade costs. And what, so what this shows is that, first of all, reduction trade costs doesn't matter that much for migration. So the, the, all this increase in migration is not due to the change in trade costs, not due to the trade. And second, internal trade cost reduction is much more important for the GDP growth and agri welfare than the international trade cost reduction. So, <clears throat> Now let's look at the migration costs. Now you can see, see, first of all, in terms of the migration flows, the reduction in migration costs is the main driving force for all this increase in migration. And the impact on welfare is also quite large. So the agri-welfare increase is about 7%. Again, much larger than the reduction in international trade costs. But all these changes are, at, again, at, like what we did earlier about trade costs, we, we hold everything else constant, just do one change at a time. So we cannot directly compare them to the data. So now what we're going to do is we're going to fit all these changes into the model and look at the change in GDP, aggregate GDP and the provincial GDPs between 2000 and 2005. The model is not going to predict the change in GDPs perfectly because there are other things going on. And we, 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 all the other things we put it on the residual as the sector region specific TIP growth. So then we, we, we're going to do a growth accounting. I give the time constraint, so I'm just going to jump directly to here. So basically what we did is then we, we introduced all these changes here and then try to see the contribution of the each individual change. But here, because the model is nonlinear, we can so there's a lot of interaction effects. How to decompose that is actually not, it depends on how we introduce the change, it's the sequence we introduce the change into the model. So we could introduce a productivity change first, and then we introduce the trade cost one by one. Or we could introduce the trade cost first, then you introduce the productivity. There are many permutations. So what we show here is basically a bootstrapping result, basically do all the permutations and then take the average and then see the con what the contribution is. So what we find that the main result is that still the largest contribution is this unexplained residual productivity changes. Okay, so technology progress or the, or the change in efficiency within the sector and, and problem is very important. However, we do account for the change in the trade costs and the migration costs do account a lot. So, so it's uh, <coughs> So what we have, so it's a total GDP change in real GDP is 62%. So we get about, uh, what, 30, uh, how much we, we got? So it's uh, about two-fifths, I think, of aggregate growth. Uh, out, of the, out of this change, the internal trade cost change, migration cost, and external trade cost change. And compared to this, the results are the same as the case when we hold everything else counted due to the do the expand one by one. Internal trade cost is the largest contribution. Change is the largest contribution to growth. And external trade cost has the smallest contribution to growth. And migration cost is also quite significant. But here I do want to mention the interaction. 
So it matters a lot in terms of contribution migration costs whether we introduce a productivity change first or introduce it later. If we don't introduce a productivity cost, then the, then the contribution of migration cost, as I showed you earlier, is about 7%. Or, or, uh, that's in welfare, in GDP is about 9%. However, if we introduce productivity cost and increase the residual change first, then the impact of migration is smaller. And the reason is that there has been some convergence in that residual productivity across regions. So the role of migration is less. But then the result is still around 6%. So this, and this is the average of all the possible changes we introduce the changes. It's around 9%, so it's quite high. So, and one thing I want to emphasize is there's a lot of discussion about rural urban migration, but actually the contribution of between province, urban to urban migration, the contribution is actually the largest. Out of all the possible migrations, that we, the cost reductions. So maybe we should think more about interprovincial urban to urban migration rather than just focusing on the rural urban migration here. Okay. And, and as I showed you, the cost is much higher for the between province migration, and the reduction is very small. But despite that, the contribution is very high. And, so, and there's a lot of more uh, potential for, for, for the contribution of reducing that, I think. Do I have time for one more slide? Thanks. So I want to do, uh, I want to kind of a quick back of the envelope cal calculation about the further reduction in migration costs. How does that going to contribute to the growth? So the back of the envelope calculation is just the following. If you look at the U.S. Census data and you look at the workers who work in the state uh, but outside the state of birth, and that number has been fairly stable around one third uh, over the years. And in China, that number is much smaller. It's, it's like a 7%. So what we did is that in the model, they say, let's reduce the inter-provincial migration cost uniformly across all the provinces. So on, the, on average, one third is the number of, people, of, of the migrant workers working outside the province of the hooker registration. What will happen? What we find is that this, we, we got 23% 20, of GDP growth as a result. Of course, this, this is from starting from 2005. Maybe some of those growth has already been has already be realized. But, uh, but uh, I'm not sure, because uh, the, all the indications suggest that like, Lauren was talking about heterogeneity in terms of the migration. The rural urban migration within the province seems to be, has been significantly relaxed over the years. But the, the migration going to the big cities, like Beijing and Shanghai, is probably now getting harder than before. The emphasis now is a stricter control of the city population. So I'm not sure. I, I, I don't, we don't have the micro data uh, for the 2010. Um, but so, the, so that, that would be that for the future research. So the conclusion. So we, 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 we set up a general career model for both trade and migration, and used to quantify uh, what happens in China. We find that the reforms in terms of both trade cost reduction and migration cost reduction account for a lot of China's growth. And the external trade liberalization actually accounts for much less than the internal reforms, so reducing migration costs and reducing internal trade costs. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for asking me to discuss the paper. It's always a bit challenging to be asked to discuss a paper that's R&R &R at the AER, especially when you agree with the decision. Uh, so first, let me tell you quickly what I like about this paper and why I think eventually you will see it in the AER. Um, this paper asks a question of first order importance. What are the welfare implications of loosening the barriers to migration and trade within China? The standard story about China very much involves international trade and, and trade-driven growth, as, as Zhao Dong said. That flies in the face of everything we've learned in the last 20 years in trade. The last 20 years of trade have taught us anything. It's that trade just does not contribute that much to growth and income, especially for a large economy like China. Okay? So let's look instead within China, and in, in particular in the case of Huku, there's a very obvious, very visible distortion that we should be thinking about. It takes a very tested framework for the most part. I'll come back to that in one moment. So from this trade literature, we've sort of learned that if you combine three things, which is you have to use all Frechet distributions, use all power functional forms, and make every tax and distortion proportional. If you're willing to stick to that sort of class of models, then what you'll find is that there's extremely tractable analytical solutions 
in many cases, closed form solutions to what look like arbitrarily complicated problems. Okay, so you can solve an n country, infinite commodity, Eaton and Cordum trade model, and basically the solutions work out to be closed form. It's very nice. Uh, and then you're going to get relatively large results. And I sort of don't like the way the results are expressed. My preferred way to express that is just less than one third of Chinese growth between 2000 and 2005 is attributable to the decline in internal distortions. So uh, there's, most of this paper relies on this Eaton Cordum model. And these trade papers, there's a humongous literature that, that uses this. And I think the trade side is very well established and very well understood. And really, there's been a lot of work done. The side that's not as well, I think, understood and is very new is migration. And so I'm not yet persuaded by the migration results. And I think if you're going to push back on this paper, and I'm going to guess this is where the referees push back, this is what Chris wanted to say, it's the migration side that we need to see more evidence for. So the way this paper works is the model of migration is that workers are going to get IID draws of it's their talent that they would have if they went and worked in each province sector pair. And these are draws, again, from a Frechet distribution because that's what we've stuck ourselves with. That's the only one that gives us these convenient forms. But the Frechet is an extreme value distribution. And so what this means is that for every possible province and sector, I draw from this extreme value distribution to see how good I would be there. They face flow costs, not fixed costs, but flow costs to moving. And then they optimize their work to, to location. To calibrate this, all you really need is some data on migration flows income disparities between provinces and the average variance of, of uh, income within a particular group. Uh, and then they're eventually going to do counterfactuals. And their final counterfactual for how things could get is let's look at US migration rate. Now, as a model, I kind of I don't find this model of migration sort of intuitively appealing. This model of migration, as so I was born in, in the rural farm sector of Ohio, the reason, this model says that I drew basically 100 different possible draws. And it just so happens that I live in Arizona and work in the non-agricultural sector because I got some really high efficiency units draw for that sector. It could have been Colorado. It could have been anywhere. But that's the one that was so big that I fin finally said, yes, I'm willing to move from Ohio because I'm going to provide a lot of efficiency units of labor in Arizona. It seems really strange to me. But all models are abstractions, and so we should judge it, I think, more on, on whether that abstraction buys us a lot or not. And here I have, I have some concerns. Okay? Um, and the concern is best expressed as the fact that this model of migration is going to inherit the standard, very famous eaton Cordum property. So the property that comes out of these models is that the mean post-distortion wage is equated for everybody who works in a province, regardless of where they move to. Yeah, you have to get this. This is just a property. It falls out of those three assumptions you have to make in every Eaton Gordon model. The problem is that illogically, if we think about what we see in the data, the data that we get are generally pre-distortion wages. Okay? So the hukou, remember, the way this distortion works is we do, you move to equate after distortion wages. Okay? But the distortions here are things like I have to pay more for health care because it's not provided by the state. And I have to pay more for education because it's not provided by the state. And I have to buy two train tickets a year to go back and forth at the Chinese New Year. That's the types of distortions that we face. So if I get data on pre-distortion wages, which is what we typically get, right, uh, this is going to predict that there are enormous gaps in pre-distortion wages across sectors. In particular, if I take the workers who are born in a particular province and I compare those who stay to those who move to another province, Zhao Deng has told us that the distortion costs are something on the order of 95 to 98%. This implies that we should see a factor of 20 to a factor of 50 income differences in the pre-distortion, pre-tax wages between those who stay and those who move. I'm not an expert on Chinese data. I've never run a Chinese wage regression in my life. I already know that that's wrong. It's just not that big. Okay? And this is really a property that comes out of using this friche, this extremely fat-tailed distribution. That's, it's just naturally going to fall out of that. And this is just a way of revealing it that it inherits the standard property. More generally, the way this is calibrated, I think we're discarding or losing a lot of data. And Chris already brought this up. You know, the most obvious thing to do here is to look at the wages of workers who move before and after they move. And that's the type of data that we could use a lot more here. Uh, we could also use mean relative wages across areas. But I think the wage gains at switching or the wage gains at moving is, is sort of the obvious thing that's left. Um, and I think that might push us towards using a model of migration that's got a little bit less of a fat tail to it. The trade-off is that if you're not willing to buy Frechet, you're not going to get analytical solutions. This is always the sort of 
right at that frontier, right? If you want those analytical solutions, you have to buy Frache. If you're not willing to buy Frache, you have to give up on analytics. Another way this shows up in the paper is that when we think about the counterfactuals, it's not clear to me that this is the right way to think about the counterfactuals. Okay, so again, in the Frisch class of models, you need all taxes to be flow costs that are proportional. And Zhao Deng does a really nice job of saying that we should think of Huku that way. And the reason is that every single year I have to pay more for healthcare, and every single year I have to pay for the train tickets, and so every single year I face a distortion under Huku. Now, when I go to do counterfactuals, like let's turn them into the US from the year 2000, I'm not sure that that works because what they're going to do is take those proportional annual flow costs and lower them. But really, that's not the right way to think of the US. The US doesn't have a lower level of huku than China does. The US just has nothing like that. So the way we think about trade costs in the US, or I'm sorry, migration costs in the US is we typically think about them as being one-time costs. But of course, you can't do one-time costs in a friche. All of the analytics fall apart. So I think what I want to point out here is that there's a very natural extension of the Eaton Quarter model, which is an extremely well-tested model of trade, where you can move to migration and get very nice closed form solutions. That's Redding, that's Redding 2015 that they cite. But there's really strong assumptions that go into that because you're really constrained in the functional forms you use. And I'm seeing a couple of areas where I'm concerned that those are going to bind you really hard and they're going to really drive the results. And I want to be convinced more that this is something that's, you know, we're close enough to being reasonable that it's worth quantifying. Thank you. They, they, they would probably equivalent to change the kappa when you introduce correlations in this. You, you could, uh, so, so, so it's effectively reduce the elasticity, uh, uh, reduce the elasticity, then you've got to get a lower migration cost. I'm just, mathematically, there's some, I think there's some map. So that's one possibility. What, the other possibility is that we didn't control for any observable differences. I think there are a lot of old people who are now moving, no matter what. Uh, here we take the averages. So, so that, that, that's also maybe the reason why the migration cost is very high. Because we're, we're, we're looking at the young migrant workers combined with old people who are just not moving no matter what. So that may be that. So if we, we, if we do the same calculation within a group, we probably will, will get, again, more, 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 uh, more reasonable estimates. But I agree with you. We want to look at more micro data and see if we can get uh, evidence that's, uh, about, about the estimates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks. It's, it's a quick point, but difficult to deal with, I think, in the, in the model. I'm a little bit worried, by the way, that you draw such a clear distinction between productivity rise and things like trade costs and all that, because all these things are related. You know, like, if, if you suddenly reduce trade costs and you open up the, the whole world to uh, Chinese producers, and then suddenly you get this big inflow of uh, foreign investment coming in, you know, these companies, I mean, that, that's where the productivity growth has come from. And, and you repeat that a number of times, trade costs, reduction of trade costs didn't have an impact, it was productivity and productivity, but productivity didn't come, so it didn't rain productivity from the heavens. Yeah. Uh, Help to account for all the increase in the trade volume. So we can explain the trade volume but that increase in trade volume does not increase, does not lead to the increase in welfare and GDP much. But that doesn't mean WTO is not important. The opening up of the FDIs and so on, I think that's very important. And also there could be argument that uh, the Zhurongji was using the China joining the WTO as a way to force domestic reform. So those local uh, migration cost reduction and internal trade cost may not happen if China was not trying to join the WTO. So I totally agree with you. But um, we, we're just try trying to say, purely reduce the cost by increasing more exports in the commodity, that doesn't give you much. Any other comments or questions? There another quick, completely unrelated point to the one I just made. What, what's, what's so, difference so important between in, inter-regional and intra-regional, I mean, like migration, that you get such big differences between one and the other. I mean, it, I mean, it's basically dictated by distance and whether you cross a border or not, shouldn't make a difference to the lambda. You get a lambda of 
0.95 in, in the version of, that I've seen. And then you suddenly say, if you just focus on in, on intra-regional, it goes down to 0.5. I mean, what what is the key variable that makes borders so important? Yeah, my question is a follow-up on the question that Chris just asked, and that is, is an answer that uh, when you migrate interregionally, there are many different regions you might migrate to, and which one you do migrate to depends on where you would get the highest gain, or am I misunderstanding? If you are local residents, that is within the province, then you are, you are my constituency. So I need to look after you. So the government will have less restrictions on you. But if you move somewhere else, the other government will not treat you as Yes. Yeah, it's mainly the hukou restriction, and not only rural urban, but also interregional. A final remark. Sorry. Sorry, so I just want to answer that question. So for example, I ask uh, the, the people working in the health salon, I say, do you have health insurance? They say, yes. Well, well, that's great. And they say, well, my health insurance is hometown. I bought health in the policy there. As, and they, so if they are local migrations, then if they're sick, they can easily have access to the, to the health insurance services. But if they're working in Shanghai from Sichuan, they, they can. So that, that cost is quite, quite large. It's much smaller, yeah, much less spending, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we're running a little bit late, but uh, let's take a 15 minute break and try to start uh, well, let's just, we'll just start 11, so we're going to be.